the uh, closing chapters <clears throat> of the book of the Revelation, the Lord Jesus gives his apostle John to behold something that has been purposed from before the foundations of the world. This is something that God, as, as John sees this, this is, this is something that God has purposed. God willed this to be. And now, and now, as the fullness is beginning to dawn, the fullness is beginning to dawn of what God had purposed, he sees that it's not happening here, and it's not happening now. He sees that the first heavens and the first earth were passed away. And he was seeing a new heavens and a new earth coming into being. This is where God was going to do the, the fullness of his work. All that the apostle was given to see, those things that which were and are and that were to come, is that which God had desired. This wasn't just a, a cold-hearted purpose that God was fulfilling. This was the very desire of his heart. And as God surveyed this wonderful accomplishment, the accomplishing work that his lamb had accomplished for him, John heard a voice from the throne from him who sat upon the throne, he said with a great voice, it is done. All that was occurring here, all that was happening was in perfect harmony and perfect accord with the good pleasure of God's will. God had determined this to be so. He had purposed it. He had even declared it to all the creation of what he would do. He would do this very thing. He even told them about it before it happened. And he said, just as I have spoken it, so has it come to pass. The good pleasure of God had been accomplished, and it had been accomplished by his lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with a loud voice, God would summon all the heavenly beings there. He would summon the principalities and powers. He would summon the innumerable company of angels. He would summon the, the four living creatures and the four and twenty elders to see that which he had purposed had come to pass. And here's what he had declared. He said, Behold, the tabernacle of God is is with men. God purposed this desired habitation. He wanted this desired habitation. And Jesus had made it ready. Jesus had made this habitation of God ready. And he prepared that place for us in that habitation. And God said he will dwell. He will dwell with them. Talking about in the fullest sense of dwelling. God is going to dwell with these, these ones that have been prepared. It's according to his good pleasure. And there's the fullest benefits to men in this habitation. And that being, they have full access to God. Because of what Jesus has accomplished, there would be no bounds, there would be no limitations they were be given to behold the beauty of the Lord in the fullness of his holiness and in the fullness of our holiness. Of that which Jesus accomplished, we would be able to behold him in this. And God would be able to behold us, the work, his perfect work completed by Jesus Christ. And we would be given to inquire of him even here in the new heavens and the new earth, because there's more of God still to be seen. Even in the ages to come, God will show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus our Lord. See, so the revelation of God does not end with the book. The revelation continues on 
into the world to come and into the ages to come. But see, we had to be prepared to receive the fullness of this blessing. And that's the work that Jesus is accomplishing right now on the earth with his people. We're going to dwell with him all the days of our lives. And the Lord said, they shall be my people. A people that is a perfect reflection of the image of himself in righteousness and true holiness. Being conformed to the image of his son. And to his delight, God declares, God himself shall be with them and be their God. This is what the book of the Revelation reveals about the desire and the purpose of God and of the God who is able to accomplish all his good pleasure. And to this instruction God would give to the apostle, he would say, write this down, for this is true and faithful. But we gather here these days to not only affirm about these last things being true and faithful, but we're also giving glory to God that everything preceding that chapter, that last chapter in the book of Revelation, is true and faithful as well. And that, that announcement is that God has accomplished all his good pleasure in, by, and through Jesus Christ our Lord, the man that God has chosen. And so God, as he exhorted the creation to behold these wonderful and glorious and magnificent accomplishments, he even, God, exhorts us even the more to behold the doer of his good pleasure, to behold his son. And so with a great voice from the throne, Isaiah records for us the words of God saying, Behold my servant. See, when God exhorts his people to behold something, it behooves us to behold it. Amen. There is great benefit to the people of God to behold that which, G which the Lord God reveals to us. We receive good things from God through seeing those things that God reveals. But there's also another side to this. If you don't behold this, there's great danger. See, these things are, are not just given by God for, for you to choose whether I want to behold it or not. God says, behold, my servant. He's the one who I uphold, God said. He's mine elect one in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him, and he's going to accomplish something for me. He says he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Now in this time, there were only two of the people that we talked about the other night, just the Jew and the Gentile. And everything that's recorded here in Moses and the prophets pertaineth to Israel according to the flesh. God has, has gone on record as saying about these things that pertain to Israel according to the flesh. The adoption, that pertains to Israel according to the flesh. And the glory, and the covenants, and the sacrifices, and the giving of the law, and the promises. These are all pertain to Israel. And it seems like this would be this, this is the people that God is working with to the exclusion of all others. He says, Israel is near, but there are others who are far away. He would speak it to Israel in the matter of, they're a people. Everyone else is not a people. He says, Israel is my son. The rest, they're called heathen and dogs. But here comes a word now. Here comes a word that all of us, I believe, really want to hear. That this one that God has chosen, his elect one, his servant, he's going to bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Now, as the scripture speaks about judgment, it's not always in the direction of the demonstration of the wrath of God. Now, make no mistake about it, there is that direction. 
And that direction will be demonstrated on the day of judgment when Jesus comes again, when his wrath will be manifested against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. It will be against all those who do not have faith. It will be against all those who do not believe the record that God has given of his son. But there's another side to the judgment. There's a, there's a judgment of favor. A favor in the direction of the people of God. A favor of everlasting joy. A favor of everlasting righteousness. And of eternal salvation. See, that, that judgment will be made as well. But that judgment will be made in the favor of the saints. And this portion of the scripture is declaring that this Jesus is going to bring this judgment to the Gentiles. And this is what the Apostle Paul is going to be opening up as we consider this text. <clears throat> In Ephesians chapter 3, he begins leading into this, to this point that, I, that we, want to, we want to think upon. In verse 5, he says, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. So the apostle is going to be opening something that wasn't known. If you search the scripture now from our perspective, you can see that God spoke a lot about what he was going to do to the Gentiles and for the Gentiles. Even in the very first promise that he made to Abraham, he said, In thy seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed, all of them. So this was not just specifically to Israel according to the flesh. But these things were not made known. But he says, and now, now it's revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That being, the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. See, they're, 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 they're being brought right into those uh, promises that God has made to Israel. They're going to be, the Gentiles are going to be fellow heirs. And of the same body. And partakers of of his promise in Christ by the gospel. See, the gospel is that which opens this truth up about what God is doing here, which includes both Jew and Gentile. He says, the apostle says, Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. See, God's power is not theoretical. It's effective. It's an effective power. It affects that which he purposed, which he willed, and which he desires. Unto me, who am less than the least of all the saints, is this grace given. See, grace is that, is that means by which God is going to affect all this. That he should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of of Christ. That which was unsearchable, he's going to find it and make it known to them. He's going to preach and proclaim this good news to the Gentiles. To make them see, to make them see, there's that, there's that exceeding power being manifested. It's going to make them see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hidden, God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. See, God hid this until the right time to, to, to know that those who were not uh, of the seed of Abraham according to the flesh, who couldn't trace their lineage back to Abraham, you're part of what's going on here. So he's bringing you right into what's, what he's doing in salvation. And it's not only things that are occurring on the earth. What God is doing in the earth is also being made known in the heavenly places. Amen. So God's not limited He's not just doing a work in the earth. This, what he, this work he's doing in the earth is being made known in the heavenly places to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. See, he's showing his wisdom in all of these workings. And it's according to the eternal purpose. See, this purpose that God has purposed that does not have beginning, if you will, or nor does it have end. It's an eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
So we're coming to the, to the text now that I want to consider for today, this matter of this eternal purpose and God accomplishing this eternal purpose, a purpose that he purposed, he talked about, he, this, was, this was, a, was a manifestation of that which he desired, but he accomplished it in Christ Jesus. And here's, here's some of the, this matter of these accomplishments. In whom, talking about Jesus now, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. You can look at this as a, just like, like a minor summation of the great working of salvation. It's in whom. That's what I want to talk about today. Two things. In whom and we have. It's through the accomplishments of Jesus who was delivered up for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now because of him, being in him, we have, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, this glorious standing of ours before God is through our Lord Jesus Christ. If any man be in Christ, in Christ, he is a new creation. We have the new creation by virtue of being in Christ. Now, if you have heard and if you are in the direction of the calling of God unto his eternal glory, it's by Jesus Christ. And you by, it's by Jesus Christ that you will arrive there safely, being made ready for what is still to come. If you are escaping the pollutions of the world now and are desiring for this to be done with forever, it is and will be through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And even the most greatest and ever enduring gift that God has for his people, the gift of God is eternal life. It's given through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. See, the realization, we're talking about the realization of those things that God had desired and God has purposed. And, our, and he accomplished this through one man, the man Christ Jesus. And these things that we are partaking of or that we have, they're in perfect harmony and perfect agreement with God's thoughts, with God's desires, and with God's purpose. In whom? In whom we have. See, this, this matter of in Christ, see, the attainment of these things has been put in a place of access to men. He centralized this in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's by faith we do partake of them. We do attain them. We do obtain them. We do find them. So, if this be the case, and this is the way God has determined it to be in Christ, well, you know what God does then? He puts you into Christ. All of them whom God has put into Christ, see, have what he's speaking about here. Amen. For of God, for of God are you in Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 1.30. Through the operation of God, Colossians 2.12. Now, to all them that are in Christ, what follows is yours. We have, we have boldness, he says, with confidence. Now, this boldness and confidence has nothing to do with the earth. It has nothing to do with anything of fleshly strength. It's about the knowledge of what Jesus has accomplished in your behalf. It's in the knowledge that, that your sins have been put away by the sacrifice of himself. But the foundation, the foundation of what we have is because of what we don't have. David said it this way, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Amen. So what you don't have is now the basis, the foundation for what you have in Christ Jesus. See, what we don't have 
is not the end, but it's that basis for which we have. And so, this matter of knowing what Jesus accomplished is vital. It's vital to your spirit. It's vital to your conscience to, in order to, to partake of what is yet to come. See, the knowledge that he has put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, well, how far did he do that? Well, he did it as far as the east is from the west. That gives God a lot, a lot of latitude to work now. Yet you're, the, the righteousness of God has been attained by faith. We have been made the righteousness of God in, in his son. We have a knowledge of acceptance of God in the beloved. See, we have, by faith in what Jesus accomplished, we have boldness with confidence. And that is absolutely necessary unto what follows. That we have access. Access to grace and by which we stand. We have access to it, the scripture says. We have access to the throne of grace where we do obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Amen. But here, how, listen how specific the Spirit talks about this now. Access to the throne of grace. The throne is, is a representation or, or a symbol of him who sits upon that throne. We have access to him that sits upon the throne of grace. We have access to the God of all grace. And that's what this, this, what this glorious text is announcing. We have access. Now God's, this again, this is God's purpose. God's desired this. And so from the very beginning, in the record, God would make known his desire and his intent for men, both Jew and Gentile, to access him now unto the accomplishing of his eternal purpose, that they would be readied to dwell with God even forever and forever. Now, one of the earliest records of God's desire and purpose is when God spoke to Moses from the mount. God spoke to him and instructed him of his desire and purpose. And recorded in Exodus 25, verses 8 and 9, God said, Let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of the instruments thereof, even so ye shall make. So here, the God continues to talk about this desire and purpose. He begins to, to do this work through Moses, and Moses was faithful unto the completion of the work. Again, he says in Leviticus 26, 11, and 12, he says, and I will set my tabernacle among you, Amen. and my soul shall not abhor you. Whoa. Amen. So there had to be something that, that, that caused God to abhor his people. He says he's going to do something about that in order that he would dwell with them. And there's even more good news. He says, I will walk among you and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. Now in this, this pattern of access to God shown to Moses, there were these separate and distinct areas. The most notable of these areas was the most holy place, for that is the place where God would dwell. That's the place God would dwell with his people. He says in Exodus 25, 22, There I will meet with thee. There I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat and from behind, between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony. So all these things being recorded from right from the beginning that God's desire to dwell with his people and to commune with them and to meet with them. And there was another, one of the revealed elements or instruments of the tabernacle was this means of access for the people to the tabernacle in order that they would meet with God and commune with him and dwell with him. The scripture says of this element, 
It's the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. The door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Just to, just to hear those words, a door speaks of access. It's a door to the tabernacle, to the place where God is. And it's for the congregation. The door of the tabernacle of the congregation. But in this pattern, see, God is teaching his people, teaching about access to him. Amen. There's something that had to be made known about this door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And that is, that is something that is of vital importance, not only to the people of Israel then, but unto all people even now, both Jew and Gentile, the door to the tabernacle was shut up to the people. And the scripture will make known the reason for this condition, and it's sin. Isaiah 59, 20 says, Your sins have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. See, God has not changed in this, in the way he looks upon sin. Back then and back now, you sin and you have separated yourself from your God. Because God art of purer eyes than behold evil, he cannot look upon iniquity. So in order for men to access God, these things would have to be remedied and taken care of. And here's, here's the effect of this now, being shown to us in this pattern. Because of sin, because of evil, because of iniquity, even from the very first time that Moses reared up that tabernacle to the time of its destruction, which is some 1,500 years later, the congregation of the people was not able to access the God who desired to meet with them and to commune with them, and to dwell with them. But by the mercies of God, he would continue to show that this was his desire, and that his purpose was to meet with them and to dwell with them. So his priests fared somewhat better. The pattern revealed that the priests who were washed, sanctified, sprinkled in the blood of the sacrifice, could enter into the holy place, but no further. No further than the holy place, because between the holy place and the, and the most holy place was a thick veil of separation. So thick, they couldn't even see what was going on in there. They couldn't hear. They couldn't hear wonderful things that were being said there. They could not meet and commune with God as he had desired and purposed. Even the priests did not have this access to God. But again, by the mercies of God, to show that this is what he would accomplish, there was one day each year, the Day of Atonement, when the high priest would enter into the most holy place, but it was by himself alone. No one else came with him. He was not able to bring that one member of the congregation with him. As for the people, as for the congregation, they would bring their offerings to present before the Lord of lambs and turtle doves and pigeons at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They would make offerings of things to be burned with fire unto God at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And they would put hangings on this, on this door of these offerings. But amidst all of these offerings and all of these sacrifices to God, Yet still, that door of access to God remained shut. And it was the gospel that revealed it that these sacrifices could never take away sin. They couldn't take away that which prevented them from accessing God. There are records of, of, in the scriptures of time and time again when the entire congregation of Israel would gather around this door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They would even abide there for days, hoping to meet with their God. But they did not have access to the God who desired to meet with them and to commune with them. They did not find, they did not obtain that which God desired to give to them. 
even Moses, even Moses, who was faithful as a servant in the completion of the tabernacle, as he was instructed by God, he could not access God as God had desired. Exodus 40, 33 through 35, it says, So Moses finished the work. He finished this work of the completion of the tabernacle. And then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud above there they're on. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and it pushed everyone else out. They could not abide and commune and meet with their God because that matter of sin had not been taken care of. This tabernacle, it was an expression of the very heart of God to meet and to commune and to dwell with his people. It was but a shadow. It was not the substance of that which God desired. But it was a shadow of good things to come. And the gospel announces those good things are coming. It would be God who would make this known. He would be rising early. He would send forth his prophets with words of truth and good hope. And these things that were said were said to the people in the midst of a great tribulation. These things that we're going we're to talk about. It's just something to think about. When the people of God in the midst of a great tribulation, what do they need to hear about? What's going to engender hope unto them? It's going to be these promises that God made. Amen. <clears throat> Ezekiel 37, 26 through 27. Again, he's talking about what he's going to accomplish. He says, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will plant them, and I will multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them even forevermore. My tabernacle all shall, shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Again, Zechariah 2, 10 and 11. He says, So sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. But see, this was, he, he had a bigger desire than this, I can say. He had more than just the, the daughters of Zion to dwell with. And as the, and the prophet continues, he says, And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of them. So this matter of this great desire of God to dwell with his people is announced over and over and over again. But it would be in the prophet Ezekiel's vision of this heavenly tabernacle when the prophet heard the Lord God say this most wonderful prophecy of this, and he's testifying of Jesus here. I want to just tell you that ahead of time. He's testifying of the Lord's Christ. Ezekiel 46, 1 and 2, he says, On the Sabbath the door shall be opened, and the prince shall enter in. Now see, this is what's going to change everything here. It's when the prince enters into the most holy place. When the prince, who is our Lord Jesus Christ, with his own blood, enters into the holy place, the most holy place, into the very presence of God for us, all these things are going to change. This matter of wrath now being because of sin, where God has turned from you, it's going to be changed to favor. All who come unto him by faith now are going to be able to partake of this favor of God. But it's because the prince entered in. When he entered in, see, by his accomplishing death, and the gospel reveals that it's the man Christ Jesus, when he entered into the most holy place with his own blood, men's, chan change, man's chan standing before God would change forever. These one who believe the record that God has given of his son. The scriptures tell us about this change. <clears throat> He says, when we were yet without strength, Jesus was bruised for our iniquities. When we were yet without strength, God made Jesus to be sent for us who knew no sin. When we were yet without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. When we were yet without strength, Jesus rose from the dead, passed into heaven, and entered into the most holy place with his own blood. 
But when Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty of, on high, there would be a glorious transformation now for men. They would be strengthened with might in their inner man by the Spirit. Amen. They could say, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Now, there's things that they can do has to do with the matter of accessing God. This matter of the knowing that Jesus has indeed put away sin. These things were accomplished through our Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. So we are no longer without strength. We have been strengthened to draw nigh unto God by the faith of him. <clears throat> God would confirm these things. He would declare in his own righteousness and justice being satisfied by the death of his son and then and the, and the reception of his offering and sacrifice in the most holy place. God would demonstrate his acceptance of him by doing that which he desired and he purposed. And the scripture records it in this manner. Mark 15, 37 and 38. He says, behold, again, there's something to be seen here. Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. It's, a, it's through this atonement <clears throat> that Jesus made in our behalf for us. It was as if God himself tore that barrier that, uh, asunder that prevented men from accessing him. That which prevented men from drawing near unto God, which prevented men from obtaining mercy and finding grace to help in their time of need, God himself, speaking as a man, tore that barrier down. Amen. Through the sacrifice of himself, Jesus put away those barriers and the walls and the veils, opening up the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. In the words of the scripture, Re re revealing this truth, he says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, yeah, and I shall not remember their sins and iniquities amen. no more. See, these are, this is that accomplishing work of, of Jesus. He accomplished this before the Father, and those who have faith in him yeah. are partaking of the benefits. Amen. Access, we have. We have access amen. by faith. Amen. In the days of his flesh, Jesus himself would come with the word of God from God. This is a word from God about what he desired and what he purposed. And it's an announcement of very good news. That which God had desired and purposed, Jesus had come to do the Father, all the Father's good pleasure. And he said of himself, of the Father said of him, he shall not be discouraged nor fail till it's done. Amen. Jesus said in John 10, 7, verily, verily, I say unto you, I am that door. I am the door of the tabernacle for the congregation. See, there's, this, was, this would be a, a, a changing work now to where when, the, when, the, when this high priest entered, things changed. Barriers taken down, walls taken down, doors open, access to God announced. Jesus said, I am the door. And when he, by his death on the cross, when he finished that work God gave him to do on the earth, he ascended into heaven, and upon his being received of God in the most holy place, that door of the tabernacle of the congregation is now open unto believing men. The apostle John was given to see this as well. When in the Revelation he looked, Revelation 4, 1, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And he saw into it. He could see into the heavenly places. He could see the, the, the activities going on in these places. And he heard of these glorious things spoken there. And he did partake to a measure of meeting and communing with God, being bid by Jesus to come up hither. Now, Jesus would also announce the efficacy of his sacrifice to the world and of himself being the way of access to God. In John 14, 6, he says, No man cometh to the Father but by me. This access to God would be by no other name. No other name but that of Jesus. Jesus was the only access to God. <clears throat> so no man 
come to the Father but by me. But if one does come to, by Jesus Christ, Jesus is faithful and true to bring you further than ever any other man has ever been brought to. He's going to bring you to God. He will also continue to present you faultless in his presence. This is the work of Jesus now. He's, 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 he's preparing us for that which is still yet to come. That's coming forever and forever. Dwelling with God forever and forever. This is no small work. Amen. But Jesus will not fail nor be discouraged in it, brethren. Amen. He says, John 14, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. This is where it's going. This is where it's ending, that you'll be saved. And there's more encouragement. Let's talk about the duration or the longevity of, of that which Jesus accomplished in our behalf. Is there, is there a time limit on this? Well, the Apostle John was also given to see this glory of this dwelling place of, of God with men. He saw it as, a, as the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And the Holy Spirit revealed a particular glory of this city to John. Revelation 21, 25 says, The gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. All day, all day you have access to God. But well, what about the night? Doesn't matter. <laughs> there shall be no night there. Amen. See, in order for men to access God, that God would dwell with them, and, and he would, he would just, just desire to be his, for us to be his people, and God himself to be with, with us and to be their God, those barriers and walls and veils and all that separated man from God must be removed before him. And again, it's the gospel that declares this good news. <clears throat> that sin that separated you from your God, Jesus put it away by the sacrifice of himself. That record of transgressions that were against you, Jesus blotted them all out. He took them out of the way to God. He nailed them to his cross. And then that earthly tabernacle, the one that, as, as long as it stood, it revealed the way to the holiest was not yet manifested. When Jesus put away your, the sin of the world by the sacrifice of himself, God even took that tabernacle away. There's a historical record that this, this, that temple and that tabernacle was destroyed. And I believe that he will not allow it to be built again. Because while it stood, it said the way to the holiest was not yet manifested. If it were to come back up, what would that say? That the way is closed again? God forbid. Amen. See, God's able to do these things. He doeth all things according to his will. In the armies of the heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth. So if men determined to build this tabernacle again, God will say no. And that's the end of the story. See, we have, we have access to God. We have it. We've been strengthened with might in our inner man. We can draw an eye into God and the knowledge of what Jesus accomplished for us. We have boldness with confidence and access by the faith of him. <clears throat> so I'll just conclude then, brethren, with these words of the scripture. These are things that the apostles encourage the people of God about. This matter of in truth of what Jesus accomplished. Even the prophet spoke about this. Again, he's speaking about for God and of his desire for men. Isaiah 44, 22 says, Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Isaiah again said in 55, 3, Incline your ear and come unto me. Here and your soul shall live, and I shall make an everlasting covenant with you. And Jesus, in one accord with the Father's desire, says, 
Come unto me, all that ye labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. James would say, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. And Paul, as a co-worker together with God, says, let us draw near. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And at the very end of the book, it says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Amen. Thank you, brother.